How you doing, friends? It's good to see you. Let's invite the Lord's presence. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you are doing. The Lord, be with us. Let it be your word as spoken, not mine. Let it be your word that we hear. Let it be enriching to us so we can build ourselves up in your walk and also share it with others so we all can come into your loving life. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yet again, it's good to see everybody. Now, we're going to look at um, some kings. We had looked at kings prior in, um, different, um, in some different presentations. And we're going to look at a king um, today. This king, his name is Joram. And you find his story in, you find him in 2 Kings 8, 16 through 24. And you also find him in 2 Chronicles 21. In 2 Chronicles 21, you kind of get more of, full you know more in the more in the de in detailed aspect of his story in second kings 8 16 to 24 it's kind of you know a little minimized and it even says it in the kings when you read it it said uh you know how it always ends it says the um the the if you want to find the rest of his the acts of him are uh, found in um uh, in the chronicles so but we're gonna look, we're gonna primarily maybe read more of Chronicles, but we will, as we normally do, you know, look at the other um, books as well. But the king's name is Joram, Joharam. He was the king of Judah. It's interesting when you look at the different kings and even just different people. Sometimes you see dual names because many of them had similar had the same names, you know. So that's why it would say this name here. Um, it was a king in um, Israel, which is the northern kingdom, with this name. And then you find a king in Judah, the southern kingdom, which was with this name. And all through the Bible, you'll see dual names. I mean, there's tons of Josephs. So many times you think just one name. But you find a name, you know, you find a common name, just like how now you'll find common names, names that are common among many people. But this particular king, and again, this is the king Joharim, Johar, king of Judah. He was the son of Josaphat. Now, Josaphat was the king of Judah, and he was a good king. But his son wound up being the king after him. And when we walked, we did a presentation on Josaphat and also on Elijah. And um, we talked about King Ahab and Jezebel. And when we did the Elijah one, we were talking about depression. When we did Joseph that, we were talking about his reign. So now we're looking at Joseph as son, Joram. And he became the king, says, um, well, first let me read, um, I'll read part of Second Chronicles 21. It says, Joseph had died and was buried in the family cemetery in the city of David. Joram, his son, was the next king. This is the message version. Joram's brothers were Azariah, Jerel, Zechariah, Azrael, Micah, and Stephadim, the sons of Joseph, the king of Judah. Their father had lavished them with gifts, silver, gold, and other valuables, plus the fortress cities in Judah. But Joram was the first son, was the firstborn son, and he gave him the kingdom of Judah. But when Joram had taken over his father's kingdom and secured his position, he killed all his brothers along with some of the government officials. So look how already it starts. And the King James Version says, Now Joseph had slept with his father and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Joram, his son, reigned in his stead. And he had brethren. Again, the son's names. It mentions his son's names. And all these were the sons of Joseph, the king of Israel. And their father gave them great gifts of silver and gold and of precious things which fence cities with fence cities in Judah. But the kingdom gave he to Joram because he was the firstborn. Obviously the firstborn is the one. Now it says that he reigned, um, if you look in the King James Version, it says in the fifth year of Joram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, Joseph being the king of Judah, Joram, the son of Joseph, king of Judah, began to reign. 32 years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned 
eight years. And the message it says, in the fifth year of the reign of Joram, Joram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, Joram, son of Joseph, king of Joseph, king of Judah, became king. He was 32 years old when he began to begin his rule. And he was a king for eight years in Jerusalem. So it seems like he was co-ruler with his father when his father was alive. When Joseph that was alive, he had his son, you know, a lot of times grooming him. So they were grooming him to be the king. So they ruled together. But obviously when Joseph that, Jos Jos Joseph that died, that's when Jerome became the full king. And that's why it says eight years in his reign. So he started reigning at 32 years. But as we talked about, he killed his brothers. He killed all his youngest brothers and his officials to make sure, and this is cold, you know, excuse the expression. Why would you kill your own siblings? You know, it's supposed to be love in the family. Here we see when God's people turn away from God, wickedness comes in and you start to indulge in a way that's not proper in any aspect, especially in the walk of the law. We've seen that all through the Bible, and we see it mimic in our time now. We may not be killing our siblings. Well, actually, we are, and we see the wickedness is going. So we see this. Now, it says, remember, Joseph, Joseph that had made an alignment with Ahab, with the, um, southern, the southern king and the northern king started working together, even though they were split. They were supposed to be together, then they split. Do All this was due to sin, their own sins. They were supposed to be together when God had them right, but they turned away from God, which caused them to split. And then in their split, you know, so sadly, the northern kingdom was indulging in every king was wicked, even though God was still witnessing them. You know, he had prophets and people that were still being faithful there. But the wickedness was just in terms of the monarchy, which God did not want. God did not want Israel as a whole to have any type of king because he is the king. Just like now, I'm not talking about order and presidents and things of that nature. The church follows the precepts of the Bible. And that's the witness of how we live our lives and share with the, with the world. And we want to do what we see the other world. Sadly, we want to do what we see other churches do. And they're not walking in alignment of the Bible. And then, because the world is full of sin. And the, re and the wickedness is happening. We start to see it in the church and in our personal life. And we start to not walk in the way of the Lord. This is what we see with um, Joram, Jor Joram. As it said, he killed his brothers. Now it says, verse 5, this is in 2 Chronicles 21. Joram was 32 years old when he became king, ruled in Jerusalem for eight years. He imitated Israel's kings and married into Ahab's dynasty. Now it says that his wife was Ahab's um, daughter, one of Ahab's and Jezebel's daughter. Her name was um, Attila, Attila. And she was a wicked woman like her father and mother. So obviously she helped encourage Joab to lead the people into false worship. It says that um, in, if you keep reading in the, um, like we said, he killed his brothers. It says that um, God considered him and he, he imitated Israel's kings and married, married, mar, married into the Ahab dynasty. God considered him an evil man. But despite that, because of his covenant with David, God was not yet ready to destroy the descendants of David. He had, he had, after all, promised to keep a light burning for the sons of David. That's in the message. You know, in the King James, it says, and he walked, this is verse 6 in um, Chronicles 20, 2 Chronicles 21. And he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, like as did the house of Ahab. For he had the daughter of Ahab, a wife, and he wrought that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. How that the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And he promised to give a light to him, give a light to him and to his sons of Israel his sons forever, forever, it's a key word, forever. See, in the King James Version, it says, he walked in, this is on 2 Kings 8, 18, he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and did that, as did the house of Ahab, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife, 
he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David, his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him a light, to give him a, a, always a light to his children. Wickedness may be on this world, but God is still going to have a light. And this is what he promised when it says that to our house of David, because remember, Jesus was coming through the house of David to save the world. This is why it always referred to, and also the way David's behavior was. But God's promise, remember, it even goes back to when Jacob blessed his son. He said, Shiloh shall not pass. When he was referring to Judah, the tribe of Judah, and he was talking at that time, it was just his son, Judah, and the rest of the brothers. But he said, Shiloh shall not pass when he was referring to Judah, saying that the scepter, the scepter, in terms of the scepter, which is Jesus, Jesus is going to come through your line. And this is going to be salvation to the world, just as he told Abraham, through all nations, through you, all nations will be blessed. The promise he had made all the way from the beginning, when he told Adam and Eve in um, Genesis 3.15, it shall bruise, uh, the serpent will bruise your head, uh, it will bruise his heel. The promise of Jesus coming was always going to be there. And the same promise carries until, until he comes to save us. That promise, he came, he died, and he rose. And it's still a promise that he's going to come back because he said he's going to come back. Jesus, this Jesus, as it says in Matthew, shall return and will all that are believing him will be saved. So there's a promise that God is going to keep this light, regardless of how sin is. He's going to keep this truth. This, this says this truth will be spread as a witness. So there has to be a witness. This truth is not going to die out. And God was determined that this truth is not going to die out, even in our day. Not looking over in the Middle East. It's the truth that God has that he's still sharing with this world. But what happens is just like what happened in ancient times, when the different kings and the people as a whole started sinning, it almost annihilated the truth. It almost annihilated the, the ability for Jesus to come. And we see the same thing happening now. Sin, Satan is at, at so wrought with this world that he's trying to, to annihilate God's um, witness by annihilating the church, by having us practice wickedness so god's truth will not be shared that this world is going to be it's going to be destroyed but god is coming back to save and if we don't preach that who's going to be saved so god wants that salvation for humanity so this is what we see now it says that um and that's why god made sure there was still a light now it says that during joram's reign back in second chronicles 21 edom revolted from judah from Judah's rule and set up their own king. Joram responded by setting out, setting out his officers in chariots. Edom surrounded him, but in the middle of the night, he and his chariots broke through the lines and hit Edom hard. In, the, um, in um, King James says, during Joram's reign, Edom revolted against Judah. Judah's rule and set up their own king. Joram responded by taking his armies and his chariot and his armies and um, taking his armies of his chariots to Zerah. So we see how, because of Joram saying um, the same thing in the King James Version, in the days of Eden, in, in his days, Eden revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. When you sin, there's going to be consequences. And this is what God is trying to warn us. The world is sinning, but the truth still protects us. Not that we, you know, things will still happen to us, but God's truth will still protect us. And even when we go through things, he will help us overcome it. We won't give up. But there's the other aspect. When we sin, we bring problems on ourselves. The same wickedness that we see out there, we bring it on ourselves because now we're indulging. We're turning away from God, as it says in the King in um, Second Chronicles. Edom continues in revolt against Judah right up to the present. Even little Libya, Lib Libyans revolted at the time. The evidence accumulated. Since Joram had abandoned God, the God of his ancestors, God was abandoning him. He even went so far as to build pagan sacred shrines in the mountains of Judah. He, brazen, he brazenly led Jerusalem away from God, seducing the whole country. So here, as I'm saying is, now you turn your heart away from God. 
where the church is now practicing the same wickedness that the world is doing. We in our personal lives are practicing the same sins that we're seeing the world do. The church doesn't, um, the world is full of racism. It doesn't treat brothers and sisters as evil. It just, um, that's the wickedness of this world, domineering and treating people inferior in terms of racism. We see the church practicing the same thing. The same homosexuality and all these other wickedness, we're embracing it and practicing it in the church and in our personal life. And due to that, as it says, we abandon God, so God abandons us. He's always at the door knocking, but if we don't listen and open up the door, there's nothing he can do. And this is why it says sin is now starts to invade the camp. What does it say in the next verse? It says, one day he got a letter from Elijah the prophet. So this is still when Elijah was alive. Well, you know, he wasn't translated yet. It read, from God, the God of your ancestor, David, a message. Because you have not kept the ways of Joseph, your father, and Ezra, your grandfather. So he is showing you had an example right in front of you, but you chose not to follow it. The kings of Judah, the kings of Judah, but had taken up with the ways of the kings of Israel in the north because they were the ones practicing the apology blatantly. Now in Judah was doing the same thing, leading Judah and Jerusalem away from God, going step by step down the apostasy path of Ahab and his crew. So it said, why you even kill, why you even killed your own brothers? So it's saying the way we treat each other, the violence that humanity puts place on each other. And in his case, his own brothers, all of them better than better men than you. God is going to afflict you your people, your wives, your sons, and everything you have with a terrible plague, and you are going to come down with a terrible disease of the colon, painful and humili humiliating. That's what it says in the um, message version. In the King James Version, it says, and there came a writing to him from Elijah, the prophet saying, thus said the Lord God of David, thy father, because thou hast not walked in the ways of Joseph thy father, nor in the ways of Ezra the king of Judah, but has walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and has made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to go whoring like to the whoredoms of the house of Ahab, who has slain thy brethren of thy father's king, father's house, which were better than thyself. Behold. With a great plague will the Lord smite thy people and thy children and thy wives and all the goods. And thou shalt have great sickness by disease of the bowels until thy bowels fail, fall out by reason of sickness day by day. So here, the Lord sent a letter from Elijah. Elijah sent a letter to um, King Joram saying what the result of your sin is going to be. The same letter we get is coming from the word of God. You look in Numbers, Numbers 20, Numbers 32, 23, Numbers 22, 33. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sins will find you out. Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifices for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of looking for of judgment and fury indignation, which shall devour devour the adversaries. He that despises Moses' law died without mercy under the two under two or three witnesses. We was talking about in ancient in the ancient times of how much of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be brought through thought worthy, who hath trodden under the foot of the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant, whereas he was sacrificed an unholy thing, and hath thus despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, vengeance belongs unto me, I will recompromise, re says the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So, as it said, Jordan got a letter. We're getting the same letter from the word of God. We do want to acknowledge 
the word of God. We don't want to, we're doing these sins and God is sending us a letter. He's telling us to read his word. And when you read his word, we see if you sin, this is what's going to happen to you. These things. So just like how Joram and sometimes we think we can sin with no consequences because we're just going wild in what we're doing and justifying it. God sends us warning after warning through his word and other people mention it and it's coming from his word saying this is the result of your sins. We know that it says the wages of sin is death. The ultimate wages of sin is death because God is going to annihilate sin and bring us back to a whole new perfection of life. And he doesn't want us to be lost. And if we keep, that's the ultimate sin. And even in the time that we are now, if we keep sinning, these de de devastations are going to happen to us. As it said to Jorah, Jor that this was going to happen to him. And this is because he did not want to follow God's uh, practices, God's teaching. And it's affected him and his whole household because for several reasons. One, the kingdom started following the same practices. Because remember, God judges each individual individually. But there's consequences sometimes as a whole that happens. God is still fair. He will protect people. We all remember that even when sin was in the camp, remember, if you look back, the widow, these were people that was, God was still protecting you know, that Elijah and Elisha went to go see and different people, God still protected them. And because he showed salvation for the individual the, uh, individual aspect, but there was still a famine in the land, but God still protected his faithful people that believed. So when he said this plague, this plague is happening because they're following the same practices that you said. The other thing is, this is why God said not to have a king. The king had absolute rule. Now you're letting the king dictate what God is supposed to dictate. We see the same thing. When we turn away from God, we believe and let everything else that's out there dictate to us. So when God puts punishment on that, everybody's going to be affected because now you're let, letting God lead. It's God is fair. God is balanced, but man isn't. And when we decide to turn away from God, we're listening to the devil. And that's going to be the result of it. And here we see that this was going to happen. And it said... This sickness is going to happen to him. And, you know, the way it described, nobody knows exactly what it is, but it says it's going to affect his, um, affect his bowels. It's, um, it's a terrible plague and it's going to be a terrible disease. To, you know, in the message, it says your colon, painful and humiliated. And in King James, when he talked about your bowels will fall out to the ground. We see sometimes these sexual diseases. When you engage in these, um, um, sexual um, um, fornication and adultery and things of that nature, you can catch something. And all types of other illnesses that are out there because of our behavior, you're eating unhealthy, you're doing all these things, drinking and smoking and doing all these things. And even if you quote unquote take care of yourself, indulging in sin, you know, now they're smoking marijuana illegally and everything. But even if it's not that, turning your heart against the Lord, you're going to get the result of sin. Atheists, that are saying they don't believe in God. Sin, God is going to punish you because of the, your sin. And us who say we serve in God, but serving in, in a sinful manner, sin, your sins will find you out. And this is what we see here happening. Happened then and it's happening now. Now it says, the trouble started with the invasion, as we said, how Edom attacked them. Because at that time, Edom didn't have a king. So all of a sudden, the boundaries that God was protecting them with are now being removed. Us following God, there's things that are protecting us because God is protecting us. And now slowly those things are starting to be removed and now we're being attacked by different things of sin. This is what was happening. The trouble, so it was Eden. Trouble started with an invasion. This is back in 2 Chronicles 21. God incited the Philistines and the Arabs who lived near the Egyptians to attack Jerusalem. They came to the borders of Judah, forced their way in and plundered the place robbing the royal palace of everything in it, including his wives and sons. One son, his youngest Ezra, was left behind. The terrible and fatal disease in his colon followed. After about two years, he was totally incoherent, incontent, and died, died in rathering in pain. His people didn't honor him by lighting a great bonfire as was the custom of his ancestors. He was 32 years old when he became king and reigned for eight years in Jerusalem. So he was only 40. He, he died at 40. 
there were no tears shed when he died. And it was good riddance. And they buried him in the city of David, but not in the royal cemetery. So he didn't die. He didn't live a long time. He died early. Honor your parents, your father, and your mother. So your days shall be long. Honor God in our days and years. But even if you die young in the Lord, it's better to die in the Lord than to die in sin. And here we see your sins will find you out. This is what we see happen. It says, um, it says in the King, um, in the King James Version, it says, 32 years old, and it came, and it came to pass that in the process of time, after the end of the two years, his bowels fell out by reason of his sickness. So he died of a sore disease, and his people made no burning for him, like the burning of his father. 32 years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem of eight years and departed without being desired. How that they buried him in the city of David, but not in the sculptures of the king. So here we see how he died. The wickedness of his life ended. His sons and his wives were taken away and killed. The only one son was left, Azariah. And we'll read about him. We'll talk about him next time. But we see your sins will find you out. And God wants us to be saved. He's trying to do everything they can that we can be saved. So let us not turn our back on God. Let's stay faithful to him and he will guide us and give us the best that he can give us in this world. And then in the world made new, we're going to get even more. But why turn our back on God and lose out on the greatest thing that he had for us, his love. And in his love, he has everything for us, a whole new world. So let's remember when we see some of these stories, how it's, it was a real story and it's applicable to us now. God wants us to be faithful to him because he's faithful to us. And if we stay faithful to him, we will be saved. On that note, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your message. We thank you for your love that you have, your love letter that you send to us. Help us to stay faithful to you and walk in your life so that way we could be saved. And share it with us. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll see you again next week. Please support our sponsors. By supporting our sponsors, you support our ministry. Ignite Me for Jesus Ministries contributes to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. You can support by going to kadaministries at yahoo.com or contacting Elder L.D. Carr at this number, 256-551-6275. The purpose of Ignite Me for Jesus Ministries is to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a way that non-Christians become converts, converts become disciples, and disciples become mature, fruitful leaders who in turn will spread the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. This unique formula that Elder Carr has developed over the years and has helped several pastors quickly gain students for Bible study, reaping meetings, or even revelation seminars. The Student Finder system will produce dedicated Bible students that are ready to learn and eager to study with someone. When the students have finished the first two lessons, their names will be submitted to the pastor for follow-up, and then they prepare for baptism. The Bible Student Finder Ministry is the best ministry of its kind. Get in touch with us today, 256-551-6275.